Section 21 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1, by John G. Nicolay and John Hay Section. 21. Lincoln and Trumbull. To follow closely the chain of events, growing out of the repeal of the Missouri Compromise at Douglas's instigation, we must now examine its effect upon the political fortunes of that powerful leader in his own state. The extreme length of Illinois from north to south is 385 miles. In geographical situation it extends from the latitude of Massachusetts and New York to that of Virginia and Kentucky. The great westward stream of emigration in the United States had generally followed the parallels of the latitude. The pioneers planted their homes as nearly as might be in a climate like the one they had left. In process of time, therefore, northern Illinois became peopled with settlers from northern or free states, bringing their anti-slavery traditions and feelings. Southern Illinois, with those from southern or slave states, who were as naturally pro-slavery, the Virginians and Kentuckians readily became converts to the thrift and order of free society, but as a class they never gave up or conquered their intense hatred of anti-slavery convictions based on merely moral grounds, which they indiscriminately stigmatized as abolitionism. Impelled by this hatred, the lawless element of the community was often guilty of persecution and violence in minor forms, and in 1837, as already related, it prompted the murder of Lovejoy in the city of Alton by a mob for persisting in his right to publish his anti-slavery opinions. This was its gravest crime, but a narrow spirit of intolerance extending even down to the rebellion kept on the statute books a series of acts prohibiting the settlement of free blacks in the state. It was upon this field of radically diverse sentiment that in the year 1854, Douglas's sudden project of repeal fell like a thunderbolt out of a clear sky. A Democratic governor had been chosen two years before, a Democratic legislature, called together to consider merely local and economic questions, was sitting in extra session at Springfield. There was doubt and consternation over the new issue. The governor and other prudent partisans avoided a public committal, but the silence could not be long maintained. Douglas was a despotic party leader, and President Pierce had made the Nebraska bill an administration question. Above all, in Illinois, as elsewhere, the people at once took up the discussion, and reluctant politicians were compelled to avow themselves. The Nebraska bill, with its repealing clause, had been before the country some three weeks, and was yet pending in Congress, when a member of the Illinois legislature introduced resolutions endorsing it. Three Democratic state senators, two from northern and one from central Illinois, had the courage to rise and oppose the resolutions in vigorous and startling speeches. They were N. B. Judd of Chicago, B. C. Cook of La Salle, and John M. Palmer of Macopin. This was an unusual party phenomenon, and had its share in hastening the general agitation throughout the state. Only two or three other members took part in the discussion. The Democrats avoided the issue the Whigs hoped to profit by the dissension. There was the usual rush of amendments and of parliamentary strategy, and the endorsing resolutions, which finally passed in both houses in ambiguous language, and by a diminished vote, were shorn of much of their political significance. Party organization was strong in Illinois, and for the greater part, as the popular discussion proceeded, the Democrats sustained and the Whigs opposed the new measure. In the northern counties, where the anti-slavery sentiment was general, there were a few successful efforts to disband the old parties and create a combined opposition under the new name of Republicans. This, it was soon apparent, would make serious inroads into existing Democratic majority. But an alarming counter-movement in the central counties, which formed the Whig stronghold, soon began to show itself. Douglas's violent denunciation of abolitionists and abolitionism appealed with singular power to Whigs from slave states. The party was without a national leader. Clay had died two years before, and Douglas made skillful quotations from the great statesman's speeches to bolster up his new propagandism. In Congress only a handful of Southern Whigs opposed the repeal, 
and even these did not dare place their opposition on anti-slavery grounds. And especially the familiar voice and example of the neighboring Missouri Whigs were given unhesitatingly to the support of the Douglas scheme. Under these combined influences, one or two erratic but rather prominent Whigs in central Illinois declared their adherence to Nebraskaism and raised the hope that the Democrats would regain in the center and the south all that they might lose in the northern half of the state. One additional circumstance had its effect on public opinion. As has been stated, in the opposition to Douglas's repeal, the few avowed abolitionists and the many pronounced free soilers, displaying unwanted activity, came suddenly into the foreground to rouse and organize public opinion, making it seem for the moment that they had really assumed leadership and control in politics. This class of men had long been held up to public odium. Some of them had, indeed, on previous occasions, used intemperate and offensive language, but more generally they were denounced upon a gross misrepresentation of their utterance and purpose. It so happened that they were mostly of democratic antecedents, which gave them great influence amongst anti-slavery Democrats, but made their advice and arguments exceedingly distasteful in strong Whig counties and communities. The fact that they now became more prudent, conciliatory, and practical in their speeches and platforms did not immediately remove existing prejudices against them. A few of these appeared in Illinois. Cassius M. Clay published a letter in which he advocated the fusion of anti-Nebraska voters upon Benton, Seward, Hale, or any other good citizen, and afterwards made a series of speeches in Illinois. When he came to Springfield, the Democratic officers in charge refused him the use of the rotunda of the House, a circumstance, however, which only served to draw him a larger audience in a neighboring grove. Later in the summer, Joshua B. Giddings and Salmon P. Chase of Ohio made a political tour through the state, and at Springfield the future secretary and chief justice addressed an unsympathetic audience of a few hundred in the dingy little courthouse, almost unheralded, save by the epithets of the Democratic newspapers. A few local speakers of this class, of superior address and force, now also began to signalize themselves by a newborn zeal and an attractive eloquence. Conspicuous among these was Owen Lovejoy, of northern Illinois, brother of the men who, for opinion's sake, had been murdered at Alton. While thus in the northern half of Illinois, the public condemnation of Douglas's repeal was immediate and sweeping, the formation of opposition to it was tentative and slow in the central and southern counties, where, among Whigs of southern birth, it proceeded rather upon party feeling than upon moral conviction. The new question struck through party lines in such a manner as to confuse and perplex the masses but the issue would not be postponed. The congressional elections were to be held in the autumn, and the succession of events, rather than the leadership of politicians, gradually shaped the campaign. After a most exciting parliamentary struggle, the repeal was carried through Congress in May. Encouraged by this successful domination over representatives and senators, Douglas prepared to force its acceptance by the people. I hear men now say, said he, that they are willing to acquiesce in it. It is not sufficient that they shall not seek to disturb Nebraska and Kansas, but they must acquiesce also in the principle. Footnote. Douglas's speech before the Union Democratic Club of New York, June 3, 1854. New York Herald, June 5, 1854. In the slave states this was an easy task. The most prominent Democrat who had voted against the Nebraska bill was Thomas H. Benton, the election in Missouri was held in August, and Benton was easily beaten by a Whig who was as fierce for repeal as Douglas himself. In the free states, the case was altogether different. In Illinois, the Democrats gradually, but at last with a degree of boldness, shouldered the dangerous dogma. The main body of the party rallied under Douglas, accepting a serious defection in the North. On the other hand, the Whigs in a body declared against him, but were weakened by a scattering desertion in the center and south. Meanwhile, both retained their distinctive party names and organizations. Congress adjourned in early August, but Douglas delayed his return to Illinois. The 1st of September had come when it was announced that he would return to his home in Chicago. This was an anti-slavery city, and the current of popular condemnation and exasperation was running strongly against him. Public meetings of his own former party friends had denounced him. Street rowdies had burned him in effigy. 
the opposition papers charged him with skulking and being afraid to meet his constituents. On the afternoon of his coming, many flags in the city and on the shipping in the river and harbor were hung at half-mast. At sunset, sundry city bells were tolled for an hour to signify the public mourning at his downfall. When he mounted the platform at night to address a crowd of some five thousand listeners, he was surrounded by a little knot of personal friends, but the audience before him was evidently cold, if not actively hostile. He began his speech, defending his course as well as he could. He claimed that the slavery question was forever settled by his great principle of popular sovereignty, which took it out of Congress and gave it to the people of the territories to decide as they pleased. The crowd heard him in sullen silence for three quarters of an hour. When their patience gave out, they began to ply him with questions. He endured their fire of interrogatory for a little while till he lost his own temper. Excited outcry followed angry repartee. Thrust and rejoinder were mingled with cheers and hisses. The mayor, who presided, tried to calm the assemblage, but the passions of the crowd would brook no control. Douglas, of short, sturdy build, an imperious and controversial nature, stood his ground courageously, with flushed and lowering countenance hurling defiance at his interrupters, calling them a mob, and shaking his fist in their faces. In reply the crowd groaned, hooted, yelled, and made the din of pandemonium. The tumultuous proceeding continued until half-past ten o'clock at night, when the baffled orator was finally but very reluctantly persuaded by his friends to give up the contest and leave the stand. It was trumpeted abroad by the Democratic newspapers that, in the order-loving, law-abiding, abolition-ridden city of Chicago, Illinois' great statesman and representative in the United States Senate was cried down and refused the privilege of speaking, and as usual the intolerance produced its natural reaction. Since Abraham Lincoln's return to Springfield from his single term of service in Congress, 1847 to 1849, though by no means entirely withdrawn from politics, his campaigning had been greatly diminished. The period following had been for him years of work, study, and reflection. His profession of law had become a deeper science and a higher responsibility. His practice, receiving his undivided attention, brought him more important and more remunerative cases. Losing nothing of his genial humor, his character took on the dignity of a graver manhood. He was still the center of interest of every social group he encountered, whether on the street or in the parlor. Serene and buoyant of temper, cordial and winning of language, charitable and tolerant of opinion, his very presence diffused a glow of confidence and kindness. Wherever he went, he left an ever-widening ripple of smiles, jests, and laughter. His radiant good fellowship was beloved and sought alike by political opponents and partisan friends. His sturdy and delicate integrity, recognized far and wide, had long since won him the blunt but hearty sobriquet of Honest Old Abe. But it became noticeable that he was less among the crowd and more in the solitude of his office or his study, and that he seemed ever in haste to leave the eager circle he was entertaining. It is in the midsummer of 1854 that we find him reappearing upon the stump in central Illinois. The rural population always welcomed his oratory, and he never lacked invitations to address the public. His first speeches on the new and all-absorbing topic were made in the neighboring towns and in the counties adjoining his own. Towards the end of August, the candidates for Congress in that district were, in Western phrase, on the track. Richard Yates, afterwards one of the famous war governors, sought a re-election as a Whig. Thomas L. Harris, as a Douglas Democrat, strove to supplant him. Local politics became active, and Lincoln was sent for from all directions to address the people. When he went, however, he distinctly announced that he did not propose to take up his time with this personal and congressional controversy. His intention was to discuss the principles of the Nebraska Bill. Once launched upon this theme, men were surprised to find him imbued with an unwanted seriousness. They heard from his lips fewer anecdotes and more history. Careless listeners who came to laugh at his jokes were held by the strong current of his reasoning and the flashes of his earnest eloquence, and were lifted up by the range and tenor of his argument into a fresher and purer political atmosphere. The new discussion was fraught with deeper questions than the improvement of the Sagamon, protective tariffs, or the origin of the Mexican War. Down through incidents of legislation, through history of government, even underlying cardinal maxims of political philosophy, it touched the very bedrock of primary human rights. 
Such a subject furnished material for the inborn gifts of the speaker, his intuitive logic, his impulsive patriotism, his pure and poetical conception of legal and moral justice. Douglas, since his public rebuff at Chicago on September 1st, had begun, after a few days of delay and rest, a tour of speech-making southward through the state. At these meetings he had at least a respectful hearing, and as he neared central Illinois the reception accorded him became more enthusiastic. The chief interest of the campaign finally centered in a sort of political tournament which took place at the Capitol, Springfield, during the first week of October. The state agricultural fair having called together great crowds, and among them the principal politicians of Illinois. This was Lincoln's home, in a strong Whig county, and in a section of the state, where that party had hitherto found its most compact and trustworthy forces. And yet Lincoln had made but a single speech there on the Nebraska question. Of the federal appointments under the Nebraska bill, Douglas secured two for Illinois, one of which, the office of Surveyor General of Kansas, was given to John Calhoun, the same man who, in the pioneer days twenty years before, was a county surveyor in Sagamon, and had employed Abraham Lincoln as his deputy. He was also the same who, three years later, received the subsequent of John Candlebox Calhoun, having acquired unenviable notoriety from his reputed connection with the Cincinnati Directory and Candlebox election frauds in Kansas, and with the famous Lecompton Constitution. Calhoun was still in Illinois doing campaign work in propagating the Nebraska faith. He was recognized as a man of considerable professional and political talent, and had made a speech in Springfield to which Lincoln had replied. It was, however, merely a casual and local affair, and was not described or reported by the newspapers. The meetings at the state fair were of a different character. The audiences were composed of leading men from nearly all the counties of the state. Though the discussion of party questions had been going on all summer, with more or less briskness, yet such was the general confusion in politics that many honest and intelligent voters, and even leaders, were still undecided in their opinions. The fair continued nearly a week. Douglas made a speech on the first day, Tuesday, October 3rd. Lincoln replied to him on the following day, October 4th. Douglas made a rejoinder, and on that night, and the succeeding day and night, a running fire of debate ensued, in which John Calhoun, Judge Trumbull, Judge Sidney Breeze, Colonel E. D. Taylor, and perhaps others, took part. Douglas's speech was doubtless intended by him, and expected by his friends, to be the principal and the conclusive argument of the occasion. But by this time the Whig party of the central counties, though shaken by the disturbing features of the Nebraska question, had nevertheless reformed its lines, and assumed the offensive to which its preponderant numbers entitled it, and resolved not to surrender either its name or organization. In Sagamon County, its strongest men, Abraham Lincoln and Stephen T. Logan, were made candidates for the legislature. The term of Douglas's colleague in the United States Senate, General James Shields, was about to expire, and the new legislature would choose his successor. To the war of party principles was therefore added the incentive of brilliant official prize. The Whigs were keenly alive to this chance and its influence upon their possible ascendancy in the state. Lincoln's Whig friends had therefore seen his reappearance in active discussions with unfeigned pleasure. Of old they knew his peculiar hold and influence upon the people and his party. His few speeches in the adjoining counties had shown them his maturing intellect, his expanding power in debate. Acting upon himself, this renewed practice on the stump crystallized his thought and brought method to his argument. The opposition newspapers had accused him of mousing about the libraries in the state house. The charge was true. Where others were content to take statements at second hand, he preferred to verify citations as well as to find new ones. His treatment of his theme was therefore not only bold, but original. By a sort of common consent his party looked to him to answer Douglas's speech. This was no light task, and no one knew it better than Lincoln. Douglas's real ability was, and remains, unquestioned. In many qualities of intellect he was truly the little giant, which popular fancy nicknamed him. It was no mere chance that raised the Vermont cabinetmaker's apprentice from a penniless stranger in Illinois in 1833 to a formidable competitor for supreme leadership in the great Democratic Party of the nation in 1852. When after the lapse of a quarter of a century we measure him with the veteran chiefs whom he aspired to supplant, we see the substantial basis of his confidence and ambition. His great error of statesmanship aside, 
he stands forth more than the peer of associates who underrated his power and looked askance at his pretensions. In the six years of perilous party conflict which followed, every conspicuous party rival disappeared in obscurity, disgrace, or rebellion. Battling where others feasted, sowing where others reaped, abandoned by his allies and persecuted by his friends, Douglas alone emerged from the fight with loyal faith and unshaken courage, bringing with him through treachery, defeat, and disaster the unflinching allegiance and enthusiastic admiration of nearly three-fifths of the rank and file of the once victorious army of Democratic voters at the North. He had not only proved himself their most gallant chief, but as a final crown of merit he led his still powerful contingent of followers to a patriotic defense of the Constitution and government which some of his compeers put into such mortal jeopardy. We find him here, at the beginning of this severe conflict, in the full flush of hope and ambition. He was winning in personal manner, brilliant in debate, aggressive in party strategy. To this he added an adroitness in evasion and false logic perhaps never equaled, and in his defense of the Nebraska measure, this questionable but convenient gift was ever his main reliance. Besides, his long official career gave to his utterances the stamp and glitter of oracular statesmanship. But while Lincoln knew all Douglas's strong points, he was no less familiar with his weak ones. They had come to central Illinois about the same time, and had in a measure grown up together. Socially they were on friendly terms. Politically they had been opponents for twenty years. At the bar, in the legislature, and on the stump they had often met and measured strength. Each, therefore, knew the temper of the other's steel no less than every joint of his armor. It was a peculiarity of the early West, perhaps it pertains to all primitive communities, that the people retained a certain fragment of the chivalric sentiment, a remnant of the instinct of hero-worship. As the ruder athletic sports faded out, as shooting matches, wrestling matches, horse races, and kindred games fell into disuse, Political debate became, in a certain degree, their substitute. But the principle of championship, while it yielded high honor and consideration to the victor, imposed upon him the corresponding obligation to recognize every opponent and accept every challenge. To refuse any contest, to plead any privilege, would be instant loss of prestige. This supreme moment in Lincoln's career, this fateful turning of the political tide, found him fully prepared for the new battle equipped by reflection and research to permit himself to be pitted against the champion of democracy, against the very author of the raging storm of the parties, and it displayed his rare self-confidence and consciousness of high ability to venture to attack such an antagonist. Douglas made his speech, according to notice, on the first day of the fair, Tuesday, October 3rd. I will mention, said he in his opening remarks, that it is understood by some gentlemen that Mr. Lincoln, of this city, is expected to answer me. If this is the understanding, I wish that Mr. Lincoln would step forward and let us arrange some plan upon which to carry out this discussion. Mr. Lincoln was not there at the moment, and the arrangement could not then be made. Unpropitious weather had brought the meeting to the representative's hall in the State House, which was densely packed. The next day found the same hall filled as before to hear Mr. Lincoln— Douglas occupied a seat just in front of him, and in his rejoinder he explained that my friend Mr. Lincoln expressly invited me to stay and hear him speak today, as he heard me yesterday, and to answer and fully defend myself as best as I could. Here I thank him for his courteous offer. The occasion greatly equalized the relative standing of the champions. The familiar surroundings, the presence and hearty encouragement of his friends, put Lincoln in his best vein. His bubbling humor, his perfect temper, and above all the overwhelming current of his historical arraignment extorted the admiration of even his political enemies. His speech was four hours in length, wrote one of these, and was conceived and expressed in a most happy and pleasant style, and was received with abundant applause. At times he made statements which brought Senator Douglas to his feet, and then good-humored passages of wit created much interest and enthusiasm. All reports plainly indicate that Douglas was astonished and disconcerted at this unexpected strength of argument, and that he struggled vainly through two hours' rejoinder to break the force of Lincoln's victory in the debate. Lincoln had hitherto been the foremost man in his district. That single effort made him the leader on the new question in his state. The fame of this success brought Lincoln urgent calls from all the places where Douglas was expected to speak. 
Accordingly, twelve days afterwards, October 16th, they once more met in debate at Peoria. Lincoln, as before, gave Douglas the opening and closing speeches, explaining that he was willing to yield this advantage in order to secure a hearing from the democratic portion of his listeners. The audience was a large one, but not so representative in its character as that at Springfield. The occasion was made memorable, however, by the fact that when Lincoln returned home, he wrote out and published his speech. We have therefore the revised text of his argument, and are able to estimate its character and value. Marking as it does with unmistakable precision a step in the second period of his intellectual development, it deserves the careful attention of the student of his life. After the lapse of more than a quarter century, the critical reader still finds it a model of brevity, directness, terse diction, exact and lucid historical statement, and full of logical propositions so short and so strong as to resemble mathematical axioms. Above all, it is pervaded by an elevation of thought and aim that lifts it out of the commonplace of mere party controversy. Comparing it with his later speeches, we find it to contain not only the argument of the hour, but the premonition of the broader issues to which the new struggle was destined soon to expand. The main, broad current of his reasoning was to vindicate and restore the policy of the fathers of the country in the restriction of slavery. But running through this like a thread of gold was the demonstration of the essential injustice and immorality of the system. He said, This declared indifference, but, as I must think, covert zeal for the spread of slavery, I cannot but hate. I hate it because of the monstrous injustice of slavery itself. I hate it because it deprives our republican example of its just influence in the world, enables the enemies of free institutions with plausibility to taunt us as hypocrites, causes the real friends of freedom to doubt our sincerity, and especially because it forces so many really good men among ourselves into an open war with the very fundamental principles of civil liberty criticizing the Declaration of Independence and insisting that there is no right principle of action but self-interest. The doctrine of self-government is right, absolutely and eternally right, but it has no just application as here attempted. Or perhaps I should rather say that whether it has such just application depends upon whether a Negro is not, or is, a man. If he is not a man... In that case, he who is a man may, as a matter of self-government, do just what he pleases with him. But if the Negro is a man, is it not to that extent a total destruction of self-government to say that he too shall not govern himself? When the white man governs himself, that is self-government. But when he governs himself and also governs another man, that is more than self-government. That is despotism. What I do say is, that no man is good enough to govern another man without that other's consent. The master not only governs the slave without his consent, but he governs him by a set of rules altogether different from those which he prescribes for himself. Allow all the governed an equal voice in the government. That, and only that, is self-government. Slavery is founded in the selfishness of man's nature opposition to it, in his love of justice. These principles are an eternal antagonism, and when brought into collision so fiercely as slavery extension brings them, shocks and throes and convulsions must ceaselessly follow. Repeal the Missouri Compromise. Repeal all compromise. Repeal the Declaration of Independence. Repeal all past history. Still, you cannot repeal human nature. I particularly object to the new position which the avowed principle of this Nebraska law gives to slavery in the body politic. I object to it because it assumes that there can be a moral right in the enslaving of one man by another. I object to it as a dangerous dalliance for free people, a sad evidence that feeling prosperity, we forget right, that liberty as a principle we have ceased to revere. Little by little, but steadily as man's march to the grave, we have been giving up the old for the new faith. Nearly eighty years ago we began by declaring that all men are created equal. But now, from that beginning, 
we have run down to the other declaration, that for some men to enslave others is a sacred right of self-government. These principles cannot stand together. They are as opposed as God and mammon. Our republican robe is soiled and trailed in the dust. Let us repurify it. Let us turn and wash it white, in the spirit if not the blood of the revolution. Let us turn slavery from its claims of moral right back upon its existing legal rights and its arguments of necessity. Let us return it to the position our fathers gave it, and there let it rest in peace. Let us re-adopt the Declaration of Independence and the practices and policy which harmonize with it. Let North and South, let all Americans, let all lovers of liberty everywhere join in the great and good work. If we do this, we shall not only have saved the Union, but we shall have so saved it as to make and to keep it forever worthy of the saving. We shall have so saved it that the succeeding millions of free, happy people, the world over, shall rise up and call us blessed to the latest generations. The election, which occurred on November 7th, resulted disastrously for Douglas. It was soon found that the legislature, on joint ballot, would probably give a majority for senator against Shields, the incumbent, or any other Democrat who had supported the Nebraska bill. Who might become his successor was more problematical. The opposition majority was made up of anti-Nebraska Democrats, of what were then called abolitionists. Lovejoy had been elected among these, and finally of Whigs, who numbered by far the largest portion. But these elements, except for one single issue, were somewhat irreconcilable. In this condition of uncertainty, a host of candidates sprung up. There was scarcely a member of Congress from Illinois, indeed scarcely a prominent man in the state of any party, who did not conceive the flattering dream that he himself might become the lucky medium of compromise and harmony. Among Whigs, though there were other aspirants, Lincoln, whose speeches had contributed so much to win the election, was the natural and most prominent candidate. According to Western custom, he addressed a short note to most of the Whig members elect and to other influential members of the party asking for their support. Generally the replies were not only affirmative but cordial and even enthusiastic. But a dilemma now arose. Lincoln had been chosen one of the members from Sagamon County by some 650 majority. The Constitution of Illinois contained a clause disqualifying members of the legislature and certain other designated officials from being elected to the Senate. Good lawyers generally believed this provision repugnant to the Constitution of the United States, and that the qualifications of senators and representatives therein prescribed could be neither increased nor diminished by a state. But the opposition had only a majority of one or two. If Lincoln resigned his membership in the legislature, this might destroy the majority. If he refused to resign, such refusal might carry some member to the Democrats. At last, upon full deliberation, Lincoln resigned his seat relying upon the six or seven hundred majority in Sagamon County to elect another Whig. It was a delusive trust. A reaction in the Whig ranks against abolitionism suddenly set in. A listless apathy succeeded the intense excitement and strain of the summer's canvas. Local rivalries forced the selection of an unpopular candidate. Shrewdly noting all these signs, the Democrats of Sagamon organized what is widely known in Western politics as a still hunt, they made a feint of allowing the special election to go by default. They made no nomination. They permitted an independent Democrat, known under the subsequent of Steamboat Smith, to parade his own name. Up to the very day of the election they gave no public sign, although they had in the utmost secrecy instructed and drilled their precinct squads. On the morning of the election the working Democrats appeared at every poll, distributing tickets bearing the name of a single candidate not before mentioned by anyone. They were busy all day long spurring up the lagging and indifferent, and bringing the aged, the infirm, and the distant voters in vehicles. Their ruse succeeded. The Whigs were taken completely by surprise, and in a remarkably small total vote, McDaniels, Democrat, was chosen by about sixty majority. The Whigs in other parts of the state were furious at the unlooked-for result, and the incident served greatly to complicate the senatorial canvass. 
Nevertheless, it turned out that even after this loss, the opposition to Douglas would have a majority on joint ballot. But how to unite this opposition made up of Whigs, of Democrats, and of so-called abolitionists? It was just at that moment in the impending revolution of parties, when everything was doubt, distrust, and uncertainty. Only the abolitionists, ever aggressive on all slavery issues, were ready to lead off in new combinations, but nobody was willing to encounter the odium of acting with them. They, too, were present at the state fair, and heard Lincoln reply to Douglas. At the close of that reply, and just before Douglas's rejoinder, Lovejoy had announced to the audience that a Republican state convention would be immediately held in the Senate chamber, extending an invitation to the delegates to join in it. But the appeal fell on unwilling ears. Scarcely a corporal's guard left the discussion. The Senate chamber presented a discouraging array of empty benches. Only some twenty-six delegates were there to represent the whole state of Illinois. Nothing daunted, they made their speeches and read their platform to each other. Transcribers note, Lengthy footnote one relocated to chapter end. Particularly in their addresses, they praised Lincoln's great speech, which they had just heard, notwithstanding his declarations differed so essentially from their new-made creed. Ichabod raved, said the democratic organ in derision, and Lovejoy swelled, and all endorsed the sentiments of that speech. Not content with this, without consent or consultation, they placed Lincoln's name in their list of their state central committee. Matters remained in this attitude until their chairman called a meeting and notified Lincoln to attend. In reply, he sent the following letter of inquiry. While I have pen in hand, allow me to say that I have been perplexed to understand why my name was placed on that committee. I was not consulted on the subject, nor was I apprised of the appointment until I discovered it by accident two or three weeks afterwards. I suppose my opposition to the principle of slavery is as strong as that of any member of the Republican Party. But I had also supposed that the extent to which I feel authorized to carry that opposition practically was not at all satisfactory to that party. The leading men who organized that party were present on the 4th of October at the discussion between Douglas and myself at Springfield and had full opportunity to not misunderstand my position. Do I misunderstand them? Whether this letter was ever replied to is uncertain, though improbable. No doubt it led to conferences during the meeting of the legislature early in the year 1855, when the senatorial question came on for decision. It has been suggested that Lincoln made dishonorable concessions of principle to get the votes of Lovejoy and his friends. The statement is too absurd to merit serious contradiction. The real fact is that Mr. Giddings, then in Congress, wrote to Lovejoy and others to support Lincoln. Various causes delayed the event, but finally, on February 8, 1855, the legislature went into joint ballot. A number of candidates were put in nomination, but the contest narrowed itself down to three. Abraham Lincoln was supported by the Whigs and Free Soilers, James Shields by the Douglas Democrats. As between these two, Lincoln would easily have succeeded had not five anti-Nebraska Democrats refused under any circumstances to vote for him or any other Whig. Footnote. All that remained of the anti-Nebraska force, excepting Judd, Cook, Palmer, Baker, and Allen of Madison, and two or three of the secret Matson men, would go into caucus, and I could get the nomination of that caucus. But the three senators and one of the two representatives above named could never vote for a Whig and this incensed some twenty Whigs to think they would never vote for the man of the five. Lincoln, to the Honorable E. B. Washburn, February 9, 1855, M.S. And steadily voted during six ballots for Lyman Trimble. The first vote stood, Lincoln 45, Shields 41, Trumbull 5, Scattering 8. Two or three Whigs had thrown away their votes on this first ballot, and though they now returned and adhered to him, the demoralized example was imitated by various members of the coalition. On the sixth ballot, the vote stood Lincoln 36, Shields 41, Trumbull 8, Scattering 13. At this stage of the proceedings, the Douglas Democrats executed a change of front and, dropping Shields, threw nearly their full strength, 44 votes, for Governor Joel A. Madison. The maneuver was not unexpected, for though the governor and the party newspapers had hitherto vehemently asserted that he was not a candidate, the political signs plainly contradicted such statement. 
Madison had assumed a quasi-independent position, keeping himself noncommittal on Nebraska, and opposed Douglas's scheme of tonnage duties to improve western rivers and harbors. Like the majority of western men, he had risen from humble beginnings, and from being an immigrant, farmer, merchant, and manufacturer, had become governor. In office he had devoted himself specially to the economical and material questions affecting Illinois, and in this role had a wide popularity with all classes and parties. The substitution of his name was a promising device. The ninth ballot gave him 47 votes. The opposition, under the excitement of nonpartisan appeals, began to break up. Of the remaining votes, Lincoln received 15, Trumbull 35, scattering 1. In this critical moment, Lincoln exhibited a generosity and sagacity above the range of the mere politician's vision. He urged his Whig friends and supporters to drop his own name and join without hesitation or conditions in the election of Trumbull. Transcriber's note, lengthy footnote 2, relocated to chapter end. This was putting their fidelity up to a bitter trial. Upon every issue but the Nebraska bill, Trumbull still avowed himself an uncompromising Democrat. The faction of five had been stubborn to defiance and disaster. They would compel the mountain to go to Mahomet. It seemed an unconditional surrender of the Whig party. But such was Lincoln's influence upon his adherents, that at his request they made the sweeping sacrifice, though with lingering sorrow. The proceedings had wasted away a long afternoon of most tedious suspense. Evening had come. The gas was lighted in the hall. The galleries were filled with eager women. The lobbies were packed with restless and anxious men. All had forgotten the lapse of hours, their fatigue and their hunger, in the absorption of the fluctuating contest. The roll call of the tenth ballot still showed fifteen votes for Lincoln, thirty-six for Trumbull, forty-seven for Madison. Amid an excitement which was becoming painful, and in a silence where spectators scarcely breathed, Judge Stephen T. Logan, Lincoln's nearest and warmest friend, arose and announced the purpose of the remaining Whigs to decide the contest, whereupon the entire fifteen changed their votes to Trumbull. This gave him the necessary number of fifty-one, and elected him a senator of the United States. At that early day, an election to the United States Senate must have seemed to Lincoln a most brilliant political prize, the highest, perhaps, to which he had then had any hopes of ever attaining. To school himself to its loss, with becoming resignation, to wait hopefully during four years for another opportunity to engage in the dangerous and difficult task of persuading his friends to leave their old and join a new political party, only yet dimly foreshadowed, to watch the chances of maintaining his party leadership, furnish sufficient occupation for the leisure afforded by the necessities of his law practice. It is interesting to know that he did more, that amid the consideration of mere personal interests, he was vigilantly pursuing the study of the higher phases of the great moral and political struggle on which the nation was just entering. Little dreaming, however, of the part he was destined to act in it. A letter of his written to a friend in Kentucky in the following year shows us that he had nearly reached a maturity of conviction on the nature of the slavery conflict, his belief that the nation could not permanently endure half-slave and half-free, which he did not publicly express until the beginning of his famous senatorial campaign of 1858. Springfield, Illinois, August 15, 1855. Honorable George Robertson, Lexington, Kentucky. My dear sir, the volume you left for me has been received. I am really grateful for the honor of your kind remembrance, as well as for the book. The partial reading I have already given it has afforded me much of both pleasure and instruction. It was new to me that the exact question which led to the Missouri Compromise had arisen before it arose in regard to Missouri, and that you had taken so prominent a part in it. Your short but able and patriotic speech on that occasion has not been improved upon since by those holding the same views, and, with all the lights you then had, the views you took appear to me as very reasonable. You are not a friend of slavery in the abstract. In that speech you spoke of the peaceful extinction of slavery, and used other expressions indicating your belief that the thing was, at some time, to have an end. Since then we have had thirty-six years of experience, and this experience has demonstrated, I think, that there is no peaceful extinction of slavery in prospect for us. The signal failure of Henry Clay and other good and great men in 1849 to effect anything in favor of gradual emancipation in Kentucky, together with a thousand other signs, 
extinguishes that hope utterly. On the question of liberty, as a principle, we are not what we have been. When we were the political slaves of King George, and wanted to be free, we called the maxim that all men are created equal, a self-evident truth. But now, when we have grown fat, and have lost all dread of being slaves ourselves, we have become so greedy to be masters that we call the same maxim a self-evident lie. The 4th of July has not quite dwindled away. It is still a great day for burning firecrackers. That spirit, which desired the peaceful extinction of slavery, has itself become extinct with the occasion and the men of the revolution. Under the impulse of that occasion, nearly half of the states adopted systems of emancipation at once, and it is a significant fact that not a single state has done the like since. As far as peaceful, voluntary emancipation is concerned, the condition of the Negro slave in America, scarcely less terrible to the contemplation of a free mind, is now as fixed and hopeless of change for the better as that of the lost souls of the finally impenitent. The autocrat of all the Russias will resign his crown and proclaim his subjects free republicans sooner than will our American masters voluntarily give up their slaves. Our political problem now is this. Can we as a nation continue together permanently, forever, half slave and half free? The problem is too mighty for me. May God in his mercy superintend the solution. Your much obliged friend and humble servant, A. Lincoln. The reader has doubtless already noted in his mind the curious historical coincidence which so soon followed the foregoing speculative affirmation. On the day before Lincoln's first inauguration as President of the United States, the autocrat of all the Russians, Alexander II, by imperial decree emancipated his serfs, while six weeks after the inauguration, the American masters, headed by Jefferson Davis, began the greatest war of modern times to perpetuate and spread the institution of slavery. Relocated footnote 1 The resolutions were radical for that day, but not so extreme as was generally feared. On the slavery question they declared their purpose. To restore Kansas and Nebraska to the position of free territories, that as the Constitution of the United States vests in the states, and not in Congress, the power to legislate for the rendition of fugitives from labor, to repeal and entirely abrogate the fugitive slave law, to restrict slavery to those states in which it exists, to prohibit the admission of any more slave states, to abolish slavery in the District of Columbia, to exclude slavery from all territories over which the general government has exclusive jurisdiction, and finally to resist the acquirement of any more territories unless slavery shall have been therein forever prohibited. Relocated Footnote 2 in the meantime our friends, with a view of detaining our expected bolters, had been turning from me to Trumbull till he had risen to thirty-five, and I had been reduced to fifteen. These would never desert me except by my direction. But I became satisfied that if we could prevent Matson's election one or two ballots more, we could not possibly do so as a single ballot after my friends should begin to return to me from Trumbull. So I determined to strike at once, and accordingly advised my remaining friends to go for him, which they did, and elected him on that, the tenth ballot. Such is the way the thing was done. I think you would have done the same under the circumstances, though Judge Davis, who came down this morning, declares he never would have consented to the forty-seven opposition men being controlled by the five. I regret my defeat moderately, but am not nervous about it. Lincoln to Washbourne, February ninth, 1855. M.S. End of section 21